Okay. All right. Um, so he's not listening, but I'm really pleased to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Peter Juni, um, who's given these rounds quite a few times. Um, as most of you know, he is leaving the University of Toronto. Um, so this will be his last rounds here as a professor at the University of Toronto, but hopefully we can bring him back uh, as an invited speaker. So um, Dr. Juni is a general internist and uh, epidemiologist and works uh, out of St. Michael's Hospital. He holds a tier one Canada research chair in uh, clinical epidemiology of chronic diseases. Um, and uh, it comes from Switzerland. So he trained in um, Bern and Bristol, UK, uh, prior to coming to St. Michael's Hospital to work at the Institute of Primary Care Health. Um, he has done um, many international um, um, projects, um, working with cardiologists, uh, with leading roles in major cardiovascular trials, uh, including SIRTAC leaders, fame two in matrix trials, um, as well as um, co-authoring European guidelines on uh, myocardial revascularization. Um, now, most of us, I think, know him a, a little bit better more recently for his work as uh, the lead for the scientific table uh, for Ontario during the COVID pandemic. Um, he was scientific director from uh, July 2020 to May 2022. He's just stepped down uh, and has really um, done a phenomenal job leading the province through a very difficult time, um, providing data uh, to help with decisions uh, even when the data and um, was not looked upon um, <clears throat> fondly by many of the people involved in the decision making. Um, so he's going to talk with us about that as well as what he sees as next steps. Um, as you all know, he's in the middle of moving back to Switzerland. So he is um, working from home um, today and is having some internet difficulties and has completely disappeared at this moment. So hopefully he's going to come back as soon as he reboots everything. Um, and if anybody has any suggestions on how we can uh, help him get his internet to stop glitching, we'll take that. But it may be um, an audio only presentation and, um, and just the slides and he may have to turn off his video. And hopefully he shows back up. He was going to reboot, um, I guess, the modem or whatever. So he should be back, hopefully. <laughs> they have lost him completely. <laughs> and I'll have to give the rounds from Switzerland. Well, we've got a lot of people here, so um... we have a lot of people here, and we've lost our speaker completely. This is a new problem for me. It will. Okay, you want to tell us about your work, Natalie? One of the first webinars I did uh, during the COVID pandemic, there was some kind of internet storm. And the, the whole thing crashed in the middle of it. It kicked everybody out and then wouldn't let anybody back in. So that was fun. So we've been through, been through worse. Yeah. At some point uh, over in, probably not the summer, but on into the fall, what we'll try to do is a, a bit of a round table discussion with everyone. Uh, I think I've sat down and met with many of the scientists um, if anybody wants to meet with me, talk to Karen. She'll find a place in my calendar somewhere. She's getting very good at shoehorning this in. Uh, I think I've already met with uh, lots of you guys, but if anyone wants to sit down and talk about what's going on with their research projects, let me know. Uh, or if there's any struggles that you're having um, that you think can be addressed, let me know. And Karen's going to start coming up with the fall schedule for rounds. And so if you haven't presented in a while, um, we'll be sending you emails about that. You'll be hearing from me. You'll be hearing from Karen. On behalf of Natalie, so <laughs> kind of obliged to say yes. So you can just volunteer in advance. And, yeah, email and, uh, me. <laughs> save us the trouble. Otherwise, we'll come hunt you down. Yeah. I need Don here. Don, 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 Don would be talking about the weather or something right now. Yeah, well, Don would not be complaining about the weather today, for sure. 
Don's not with us today. Don will be complaining about something else. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, Michael, and not me. <laughs> I may not get any any uh, free discount pop for a week or so after that comment. Yeah, he'll definitely be watching this, and he will watch it later and find out what you're talking about him. Yeah, this is going to be awkward. We really shouldn't be recording this. <laughs> Yeah, Dawn is on service. I'm also on service. So <clears throat> if I disappear, um, I will maybe Michael or Candace or someone can uh, run the questions at the end. Hopefully I don't disappear. May not be actually an issue. <laughs> not kidding. It, it may not be an issue. <laughs> Neither. He said he didn't need three or four minutes. So oh. yeah, I'm sure I'll come back. Don would be very disappointed in the silence. So if anyone has anything they want to say, how about you, Michael? You have any anything Nemo. you want to say about your weekend? Uh, well, I just got back from holiday two weeks away. So I, I don't think I, I should tell anybody what I was doing because all of you have been working so hard and uh, uh, I was uh, on an actual vacation, which was quite remarkable after how many years. I think is, I'm... is this any better? Yes. 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 Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So now I, I I don't have my presentation on this computer. I restarted the internet. I changed the computer, but now I need to find out whether iCloud has synchronized or not. So just a moment. So bear with me. But at least there's something. It's a start. Sorry for that. No, that's okay. We appreciate it. You should see how this looks here. It's just like it's oh my god. Uh, not yet. It hasn't yet, but it's about to synchronize. Let's see what I can do. Um, <clears throat> Bear with me. I need another two two minutes or so to get the presentation onto. Yeah, now we're going to hear about Michael Michael's vacation then. So um so how um how is everything working uh, with ICS in terms of vacations and in terms of staffing and I, I'm sure everyone's got loads of time accrued because no one has gone anywhere over the past two years. Are you you're encouraging well, everyone to leave oh, yeah. and clear out for the summer? Or? Well, we're encouraging everyone to take vacation, mainly for their own health and mental health, uh, because everyone's been working so hard. So it's not just about having vacation accrued and, you know, uh, need to use it. It's really just to make sure people stay well uh, and, and yeah. uh, you know, take care of themselves. So, yeah, we're definitely encouraging staff to take uh, time off. We're, um, you know, uh, encouraging staff, for example, for the May long weekend to take some of, you know, take an extra day, uh, make it a four day long weekend with their accrued, you know, uh, personal days or vacation days or whatever. Um, and we're asking staff and scientists to not send work related emails for that four day period to really give people a break. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I think overall, it's just something that we all have to, and, you know, I think scientists should be examples in this, you know, in this way and, and take some time for their own sake and for their family's sake. I have to say the, the the weather was so nice and I guess because it was Mother's Day, there were very few emails over the weekend, which was actually really quite lovely. I think I got a total of 10 or 12 emails over the full weekend. I, I got, you know, people made up for it on Monday, um, but uh, over the weekend, it was quite, quite light, which is really nice. Right. Is a testament to Peter as a draw that everyone is still on this call <laughs> waiting with bated breath. Yes. I'm so very sorry. Few, very but it's here. Right. I worry. made it. I made it. I managed to download the the, the file. It seems I'm op trying to opening it now. It's only a matter of hours now. <laughs> <laughs> ah, please open. <laughs> 
Okay, PowerPoint does something. Let's see. Here we are. Okay, good. Okay. It works. Okay, good. So first I try to share my screen. Okay. Here we are. I introduced you to the group while, not that you need an introduction, but I did your introduction while you were switching over. Um, but I, I think mostly we, we all want to thank you for all the work that you've done for the province uh, and for the leadership in such a difficult time. Um, <laughs> really very sad that you're going to be leaving us and moving on to back to Europe. So thank you. And thank you for giving a talk during the middle of the move. Yeah, no, no, look, it was a tremendous privilege to be able to help and to use my skill set, to be honest with you. I, you know, when, when um, the Ukraine war started, we all felt completely helpless. And um, I realized how much of a privilege this was, and it probably prevented a, a, a stomach goals also for me. Um, that I wasn't, you know, completely helpless with um, during the pandemic with this, and this, this in itself, is just um, really just because of the of the journey how we just evolved so it's, it's uh, we were very much in this together and and i will be very sad to leave um it's the right thing for us i believe as a family for sure and it was a tremendously generous offer of the of uh, university of oxford but i will still be very sad to leave and uh, i will miss you people a lot um Let's get started here, and perhaps we have, despite everything uh, else, then a bit of uh, time to, to talk and uh, for questions, etc. in the end. So what I try to do is, um, I don't know, about eight months ago or so, we had a, a preliminary first glimpse into, you know, various aspects. I tried to uh, to continue where I stopped there uh, and uh, just emphasize a few more things and also tried to have some look into the future. Um, one or two slides or perhaps three or so are uh, repetitions, forgive me for that, but uh, I tried to, uh, to make a point. Um, and one of those that are uh, slides that you may have seen already uh, during the last presentation, are related to what at the time scared me quite considerably, the alpha wave. Um, it sounds trivial now, or it seems trivial, but at the time it actually wasn't. And while I bring this up here is because I um, feel that this was basically changing um, the way people needed to look at this pandemic, including our elected decision makers and the policy makers. No? And the, the big deal there was actually when to go out with this, you know, not to be too early and, uh, and uh, just be considered an alarmist. And by the time um, that, that uh, alpha would then become dominant and would start to uh, lead the wave, the shape of the wave, Nobody would listen anymore. And it was really quite challenging. And you see that uh, it just happened this way. Um, I started to go out relatively early just to make people aware of that the, the challenge we are seeing now is different than what we've seen before. So, and this slide here uh, came from Troy Day. And uh, what you're seeing here once more, a VOC 2020, 12, zero, uh, zero 01 became the, uh, the alpha variant, basically coming from nothing and taking off in red, whereas the um, wild type virus was just, you know, steady, slow, and not much happened. And this was the big challenge here, how to deal with that. Um, and one of the way we messaged this was that we talked about the pandemic within the pandemic or now two pandemics you see it here in the globe and mail 
that's when uh, our dashboard started, which uh, meanwhile has had uh, more than uh, 2.1 million hits, and um, we just tried to unmask um, the challenges that are happening here and, you know, are not really visible yet when you just look at that because the uh, wild type at the time was dominating number wisely and was uh, sort of uh, decreasing as you're seeing it and like um, in a, in a, at the Tour de France, you know, just some biker in the middle of the field starting to get stronger and stronger, uh, they would not be perceived unless they're actually taking over and are at the, uh, at the um, front of the field and then basically just uh, dominate the Tour de France. Here it was the, uh, the alpha variant that then all of a sudden, when it was at 50%, started to dominate the shape of the wave. And then, of course, people should have been prepared already and say, oh, that's hardly surprising. We have seen this coming and we should have reacted accordingly. That's then uh, also what we, you know, then did, you know, we, we basically just split everything, just had the, uh, the early variants and the new variants of concern at that time point, uh, alpha, with latest reproduction numbers, etc. And first, nothing happened. They had a, a stepwise reopening of the province. We, we all remember that. And then the wrong thing happened, of course. And what I found remarkable at the time, and I think this is unique, that we had so many people consistently speaking out in the province and here uh, the star, but the star wasn't the only uh, newspaper that, uh, that gave this a platform. Um, just, just really having the headlines, the front page, indicating what people, what scientists, what clinicians, what health systems leaders actually would think about what's happening right now. And this was probably, you know, this entire thing that there was um, a, a lack of understanding about what was coming, despite us emph uh, repeatedly emphasizing, it will be very challenging. People just felt that uh, at the level of elected decision makers, things go on as uh, we are now meanwhile accustomed to how they go on. So the one part is that this understanding of the, the new game needed to sink in, but the other part really was is that people really spoke up and they did so consistently, most, most of them at least, and uh, we ended up really just on the front page of the star here. No? At that time, what was also relevant is that um, the province and then uh, subsequently also, also the entire Canada had a different approach to rolling out the vaccine since we still had relatively little volume of vaccines at the time, not enough doses. It's hard to imagine that this is so uh, you know, little ago, actually. Um, there was the suggestion to just use everything we get for first doses and vaccinate as many people as we possibly could um, to uh, make it to just an increased protection that appeared to be enough also for alpha at that time. And we basically just developed the net over a lot of jurisdictions, even though we came relatively late, we struggled with vaccine supply at the time. Uh, we then caught up big time, not only in general, once this could be started, but uh, also with our biggest weakness, perhaps long-term care, where we had tried to emphasize that speeding up, you know, with the, with the current wave and then the alpha wave coming, speeding up vaccination <coughs> with first doses in long-term care would make a tremendous difference in terms of preventive deaths, as you see here. And what eventually just uh, happened then was that public health measures plus people behavior plus then with a really steep downward slope that essentially crushed alpha uh, being explained by vaccination, we, uh, we saw the, uh, the alpha wave subside 
and we went into a relatively impressive honeymoon phase that you see you know we basically just went to next to nothing in terms of cases down here and a lot of that was really the early success um, of the vaccine rollout at the time when there was no such thing as a new innovation yet. No, we expected it. Uh, we talked about it again and again, uh, also knowing that the coronavirus has as part of its nature also um, evolution playing out in terms of immune evasion. We all get um, susceptible again to regular coronaviruses over time. That's one of the secrets of success of the common cold, of course. So we made it here and we have had crushed this wave mainly because of vaccination then. So here initially this was public health measures and changing behavior. But then what you're seeing just down here, I hope you can see my cursor, this was mainly vaccination. So immune induced for the first time. And Delta hit, of course. Remember that. And once more, what is really just so tremendous is just to understand that while the original strain in Wuhan probably had an R0, the basic reproduction number of around 2.2 .2 to 2.5, the strains that caused waves one and two in Europe and in uh, North America already were around three. And alpha had an edge in terms of transmissibility to make it to an R naught of 4.5. And here comes delta with an R naught of uh, seven. As you see here, just, you know, every time an increase of roughly 1.5 fold in transmissibility, so that the calculated R naught was around seven, six to eight or so for Delta, no? which is just, you know, a tremendous difference if one, in the absence of any public health measures, in the absence of any immunity, etc., if one case doesn't result in two to three, but in six to eight cases, as you see here, it's a completely different ballgame. And something which is also important to realize here, because this, uh, of course, then came up when we were in the Omicron wave once more, um, of course, um, viruses need to become more transmissible and they need to start to ev evade the antibody mediate mediated part of the immune system um, if they want to continue to be successful and not sort of die out as measles did before we all came undisciplined with uh, vaccination against measles. So um, that's the characteristics we're aware of. And that's basically then the left part or part of the left part of the story. But the point really is there is this persistent myth once more. And I know I sound like a broken record that... Um, this all also means evolution also means that viruses will become uh, less risky in terms of risk of hospital admission, ICU admission or death. And for a virus for which transmissibility is given during a pre-symptomatic period, this is simply not true. The myth comes from viruses that are actually um, transmitted while people are already severely ill. For viruses like that, it makes sense to, uh, to assume that over time, less severity will give the virus an edge regarding transmissibility because people continue to be socially active longer. And uh, therefore, it makes sense that a virus over time that typically just results in, uh, in hospital admission, ICU admission and death and actually is transmissible while people are in hospital or in ICU, but not before for such a virus, it makes sense that you would uh, say, OK, it gets less severe over time, but not for a virus such as SARS-CoV-2. There, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And guess what? Alpha was, uh, was uh, basically more severe than, uh, than the wild type and delta again was more severe than alpha. And the reason that Omicron or BA2 now as a subvariant of, uh, of Omicron 
and uh, other viruses are actually, or other uh, variants or subvariants are actually less severe, is basically just pure dumb luck, nothing else. And we need to let go of this myth that this would, uh, would be really helping us also in the future. Uncontrolled growth, imagine, you know, a small island like Easter Island or so that uh, remained unaffected by uh, COVID for a very long time. And the first case arrives um, after 15 days with the wild type, there's still not much happening on Easter Island. But uh, when you look at Delta, you know, a first case arriving at day zero, um, at 15 days, you already end up with 340 cases. And you can just take this up to 28 days and, days and compare again. That's one of the other issues that uh, people struggle with, uh, you know, in the general public and among um, elected uh, decision makers. Uh, the early strains were just completely lame. Look at the difference at 28 days, cumulative number of infections, 670 early. Remember how much we felt we would struggle? Delta left unchecked without vaccination, et cetera, meant 60,000 cases after 28 days. All of that, that, that's one of the other slides that you've already seen, just, just uh, brings me back, you know, to what at the time when I gave uh, the first talk to, uh, to ICS, um, I called the pincer principle, you know, that we basically have one part here, typically this was Stani and Beate, sometimes it was, uh, was uh, me as well, or yeah, actually quite frequently if it came to, me, to ministers, uh, etc. but not the cabinet. We have an inside job and we tell people at the inside, um, politicians, etc., what's actually happening. But the big deal is that unlike SAGE in the UK, there was no selection of information. What we were telling people at the inside also went public. And this, remember the Toronto Star front page, um, the headlines that I've uh, shown you before um, regarding the, uh, the failure of uh, public health measures when uh, dealing with the, with the alpha wave. The, uh, the outside job in the public with all of us speaking up, a lot of you speaking up too, meant that the public opinion continued to be with us. And since elected decision makers eventually are poll driven, if you don't have this part here and you don't have the public to, to, uh, to buy into what you're thinking and doing and trusting you, knowing that they do not get selective information, but they get all the information that the government does, you won't be able to move anything. And that's actually what happened in the UK. Brilliant scientists, great trials, great epidemiology, etc. But nothing happened whatsoever. And the situation in the UK, as we all know, as in the US, is a completely different ball game than what we've seen here in terms of everything, hospital admissions, ICU admissions and deaths, and of course, also the long COVID burden. You, know? you need this pincer principle and you need complete independence of a body, of a scientific body that is able to convey the same messages internally and externally. And it worked for Delta, you know, we conveyed a lot of the messages there and what eventually happened is that Ontario halted the reopening because things would get worse. And what really happened here is next to nothing. No, when we look at that, you know, what, uh, what, what we saw with, uh, with Delta, we just kept masking, but we had a lot of, uh, of uh, societal freedoms. Uh, economy was uh, was not restricted, etc. But, but with what we did and how people behave, we basically avoided a delta wave whatsoever. And we were one of the only jurisdictions in the northern hemisphere that did so. We need to be aware of that. I'll show you then a slide later that compares us with the US. The difference for delta and subsequently also for Omicron is actually striking. 
when we think about once more just uh, how evolution kicks in, just look this uh, transition from orange to blue when alpha took over and then from blue to orange again when delta took over, look, to, look at the slopes, you know, how fast this went. And then, you know, the last one is like somebody falls off a cliff much, much steeper. That's then Omicron coming. When you look at how this all plays out, you should actually be in awe of evolution, you know. I mean, what's happening here is just with, with you know, generation times of perhaps four to five days, roughly, what happens here just in weeks and months, of course, has happened with us over millennia as well. And it just shows you how powerful adaptation actually is. And here, if, if we have just have a, a great many um, viruses out there being able to propagate in a great many people, that's how it all can play out. Meanwhile, you know, already with Omicron, we have one of the most infectious viruses that uh, have ever been out there. And we're probably not at an end yet. So what is this now about Omicron? Uh, of course, that's more recent now. And uh, you do perhaps remember how we uh, basically tried to play that. We again just uh, use the same um, approach that we uh, used before for alpha, then also for delta. But there it wasn't really necessary, luckily. There it was mainly international comparisons that we uh, brought forward that showed that we have a challenge there. But uh, here you see it, um, the, uh, the wall that was uh, basically just uh, exploding up, up, up here um, around 16th of December when Omicron became dominant. What we then did, we looked at uh, the uh, place where this all sort of originated. We're not quite sure where exactly, but uh, certainly uh, somewhere uh, around the region of uh, Gauteng. Um, we looked at patients in hospital in ICU receiving mechanical ventilation, receiving supplementary oxygen. You see that we looked at hospital deaths, in hospital deaths. And what we try to do there is just to contradict the, the myth, but also the sort of resignation that I've seen in many people um, that was a co in combination with this uh, myth. Oh, this will just all be milder because this, this was uh, basically what was um, conveyed by colleagues from South Africa. We can't do much anyway, and we just let it rip. And it was actually in the background, this was one of the, of the times when I really felt very strongly that if we let this rip, then I would probably really stay. I didn't talk to anybody about that, but then I would probably step down because I could not, you know, I could not be part of, of, of this. We needed to do something and we went out as strongly as we could really just making clear that this is all a numbers game. If the thing is so much more transmissible and if we have a wall, as I've shown you here in blue to the, uh, to the left, um, then uh, even if um, severity results is lower and uh, we have only half as many hospital admissions than uh, previously, you just need twice as many uh, people infected and we have compensated for the half as uh, high a risk of hospital admission by just a sheer numbers game. No, that was really the issue here and we needed people to react and therefore you do remember that we went out and uh, especially me with a, with a, with a um, dog and pony show and just tried to really convey to people we have a dramatic problem that's happening here. No? Here is then also for um, South Africa, you know, the same wall. And of course, they had a situation that was not comparable to ours, where nearly the entire population had been exposed to the virus previously. That's uh, what we're having now here, more or less, but they had it already when Omicron hit. And uh, we saw this uh, here, this wall, you know, for wave four, as compared with the other waves, that was also reflected in um, hospital admissions here, the orange line that you're seeing. But interestingly enough, they started to decouple more than we did also 
for deaths, as you see here. And of course, one of the reasons for that is that they had a tremendous amount of deaths. When you look at South Africa's excess mortality, it's massive during this pandemic. And a lot of those who are most vulnerable have already died. You know? And that's what you're basically just facing here. Um, what is also important to realize once more is that the median age in South Africa is 28. And they have very few people actually that, that are um, above the age of 65 there, whereas our median age is 41 years with you know, a lot of people above the age of 65. Um, a priori at a much, much higher risk than uh, younger people. What we then suggested is we acknowledged um, you can't deal with this. No? We, you, you, it's just impossible. We, uh, we can't basically suppress Omicron, but we can blunt the wave. We can have um, a circuit breaker that gives us enough time to uh, vaccinate enough people with third doses and uh, after a few weeks just start to reopen again. No, that was the idea. The, I think it was Beate Sander who came up with the uh, terminology of a circuit breaker. And that's what then essentially happened only, of course, much late than when we were suggesting that, you know, so here you see it kick in already uh, just uh, very early because the assumption was that the, uh, that the public health measures would start at December 15th, whereas we took a lot longer. Um, of course, all of that, you know, the dog and, and uh, pony show comes at a price. Um, the the, the uh, communication didn't came all, come always, you know, uh, across completely clear. So in the end, it was then just, you know, the severity is a myth. But that's not actually what I said. I said, you know, severity will resolve our problem is a myth because we have a numbers game here that uh, is important. But this didn't always come across. And you also do remember there were some other issues with tabloid press at the time that was, you know, were quite unpleasant. So here we are, you know, with our meta-analysis of all available wastewater treatment plants, sewer sheds and pumping stations in the province, 103. And what you see here is actually a peak reached, <coughs> not because of the public health measures, but because people really reacted, especially in the GTA. Before New Year's Eve, people really fundamentally changed their behavior. We also saw that in, uh, in uh, our out-of-home mobility data. So it was actually people themselves with their behavior, with their disciplined behavior that broke the wave. And we would have ended up in a high plateau most likely, if not then for public health measures that then resulted in a strong decrease in uh, the, uh, the Omicron wave so that the wave, the original wave actually subsided. It's then a combination of course of more, but the public health measures and the behavior are, you know, just uh, front and center just here in these, in these areas. Um, slowly then of course, immunity accumulated through this dramatic wave here already would start to play a role to infections. And of course, the roughly 7 million people who got vaccinated you now. And then we go down and we can look at that once more. But what I find here just so striking is for the first time then, because we didn't have new public health measures and, uh, you know, people's behavior, if anything, was, you know, associated with a little bit more opening or, or you know, at least, you know, perhaps constant masking in 30 to 40 percent of people in, in uh, public indoor spaces. This breaking of the second wave, which was <coughs> after we dropped masks, then in about 50% of people and after BA2 took over. And this decrease then is mainly explained by removing susceptible people through infections. No, there wasn't much vaccination happening anymore. There wasn't much um, public health measures around anymore. What you're seeing here is mainly infections, a bit of spring, and uh, of course, the continued masking in a subset of the population would help as well. So this is 
basically a naturally behaving wave for the first time. Many places had that already before. We waited until we saw the BA2 wave. And of course, you know, I, I, I can't remember where I have this slide from. I saw it somewhere, somebody circulated that, or I, I uh, just saw it on Twitter, even though I'm rarely on Twitter, actually. I think it, it is really, really important, you know, this, this part here with, uh, you know, see, it wasn't so bad, we overreacted. This, for the first time since the beginning of the pandemic, actually would hold for the BA2 wave, no? That's for the first time that we did not influence the wave through public health measures uh, and behavior, but we let it go. And luckily for all of us, you know, if we were uh, working in hospitals, et cetera, this time we saw a relatively strong decoupling of everything that is relevant from a health system sector and of deaths. You know, that's what was happening here. And if you want to see how things just uh, can look if you don't do much or do it in a very heterogeneous fashion here, this comparison of the US with Ontario, I hope we still have enough time. Yes, we do. Remember once more what we did here. We just masked, we had a good summer and nothing happened. You know, this is Ontario's miracle here, no? It's very little. And if you continue to say there aren't any randomized trials or only two and both of them are not exciting and the effects are small, etc., or non-significant and so on, and think masks don't work, think again and just try to think what, uh, what else we had in terms of differences between these two places. You could say, okay, this is all the miracle of vaccination, but you know, then again, by that time, you know, probably 60 to 70% of the US population had been infected already. So this is not explaining what we're seeing. We really were able to suppress this wave by continued masking and not much more, a little bit more, a little bit capacity limits or so. But it wasn't such a big deal, but it made a tremendous difference, not only in hospital uh, occupancy, but also even more so in ICU occupancy. We, we couldn't have you know, dealt with that with our ICUs. That would be impossible. The US sort of, but at a very high price too. And look at the tremendous difference in deaths. Just think of the area on the curve, how different this is. And here you see, by the way, now, that's the Omicron wave broken by the population of Ontario by changing their behavior, especially in the GTA before New Year's Eve. And that's how it looks if you let it rip wherever you look, including New York or so, much, much more for ICU occupancy and for hospital occupancy. And remember how high our hospital occupancy was, much, much more what you saw in places everywhere in the US, including, for instance, Southern California. This is um, an R effective approximated from our wastewater meta-analysis that is representative. That's how we set it up uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for Ontario. You know? And what I find remarkable here is, you know, uh, us, you know, peaking with R effective, that's still, you know, behavior and people started really just to bring this down to here, to here we make it through change of people's behavior. So, our modeling, our uh, dog in the pony show, this all seems to work. The media were again, you know, with us and helped us tremendously, which is again a big, big advantage we had. And then you see the public health measures kicking in and coming, you know, to uh, the lowest uh, effective reproduction number around the time when we start to reopen. First reopening step and we start to creep up with our R effective. And remember what then happened here is 1st of March. There's not much delay in wastewater. That's the sampling date that you're seeing here. Here is 1st of March and we start to do more reopening but also BA2 is taking over and we see this peak again. But what happens here is immunity kicks in through removing of susceptible individuals from the pool through infection. 
And you think about that, you know, where we are right now, we probably have about 55% of the population infected with Omicron or uh, one of the subvariants of Omicron. We had about 10% of the population infected before Omicron hit. We have, uh, you know, among 18 pluses, we have 94% of the population who have had at least one vaccine dose. Uh, all of those uh, probably have had Omicron meanwhile. And we have very few people at that time who have never had an exposition to the virus either through vaccination or infection at that time. A lot of countries and a lot of jurisdictions and a lot of provinces, you know, go to Alberta, have seen that much earlier than us. We only made it here, you know, and then we go down here and this little bump is then the holiday, the, uh, the long weekend most likely, and now, now we definitely go down. So this is, you know, th this is really, this is, I, 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 I would say, I, I, I tended to say this uh, behaves like clockwork, but I think, you know, when you look at it, it behaves actually much more impressive than clockwork, what we're seeing here. This is absolutely remarkable. So I would like to end with uh, just a few thoughts now regarding the future and one of the, uh, of the uh, earliest uh, um, thoughts about, oh, this is now all becoming predictable, you know, BA4 and BA5 was uh, raised by uh, Colavai in Nature just uh, very recently, <coughs> looking at the waves in South Africa. Remember, they didn't have an alpha, but they had a beta wave. And then delta, as you see, these waves are really, really high. You know, uh, remember once more also that uh, in South Africa, always there was probably only every 20th case or so that was diagnosed. So what we're seeing now here was the case in South Africa all the time. And you see, you know, some of that might start to have quite a bit of a cyclic nature. And the point then was that the colorway brings up is, oh, okay, this is probably just, you know, now the new subvariants coming and therefore we see it again and we can start to predict based also on uh, mutational patterns, etc., transmissibility and so on, where this is going. But the point here that I would like to make is there May is our November. And what you're seeing here, unlike before, you know, this was disruption, disruption, disruption. This is basically a continued evolvement over time, you know, just get a bit more specialized, but there's not that much that happens. But what we're seeing here is basically just an autumn wave. That's a regular autumn wave. And that basically allows you to look into the future if we don't have new variants. If we don't have new variants, then we just continue to evolve the virus that we have. That's BA1 and then BA2 and BA212 and so on. And we make it to BA4 and BA5. Um, and this is not much a deal. It's not that different. Of course, it evades the immune system a bit more. It may be a bit more transmissible. But most likely, this is just people moving indoors, as is the case here, mid-November. No, that's what we're basically seeing here. And this is probably just the autumn winter wave that we see in South Africa happening. No? What is important to realize once more, if you think as um, evolution as a tree, that every time something disruptive happens, one of these big branches lighted up, you know, this was alpha, this was delta, this was Omicron. And the point is that the virus continues to have a tremendous opportunity, many more big branches, major branches that it could actually bring forward. And this would then be disruptive for us no. And if this happens, if you have something like that, uh, just a new variant that is fundamentally different, expect a summer wave or an early autumn wave or a late spring wave. If it doesn't happen and we just basically continue on the Omicron branch as here and we specialize a bit more somewhere, expect an autumn wave. That's as simple as this probably will be in the future. And in any case, at any time point, be ready to do a mass vaccination rollout again and be ready perhaps to use the single most um, 
relevant intervention that we have that actually doesn't impede the society and doesn't restrict the economy that's masking. You know? We can deal with that if you're up here. If you have something completely new, we will need to see how it is. If we're unlucky and it gets much more severe, we might need to have a little bit more. But hopefully, because we continue to, uh, to evolve with our immunity over time, we continue also to see a decoupling for the first time. I know there were people out there suggesting that since the alpha wave, it's decoupled, it's decoupled, it never was decoupled, it's for the first time now. Um, so, so if we have something like that, we could start to see a stronger link between cases and deaths and hospital admissions and ICU admissions again. If we don't have the pure down block that we had this time with Omicron and it gets more severe again, as we saw before for Alpha and for Delta. So um, how does this look with endemicity? That's from 2021 and who would have guessed what has happened, you know? Uh, since then, waning of sterilizing immunity here, here uh, the basic reproduction number. And meanwhile, here up here, you know, perhaps at 11, 12, nobody knows exactly because we have so much waning immunity and uh, we have uh, just uh, antibodies being being subverted all the time by, uh, by Omicron and its subvariants. <coughs> but the point really is we make it to tremendously high here. And we have a lot of waning immunity, meaning um, we have the situation reached through vaccination and infection where our infection fatality ratio IFR is low. We have reached that part, no? So you could now say, okay, we're great. So we now have... Um, mortality, infection fatality rate that is perhaps comparable with what we see for influenza, we are dominant. That's a fallacy. While the AFR is indeed sort of similar now, the problem is that for influenza, given exposition in a season, if you have a bad season, we expect about 10 to 15% of the population being uh, symptomatic with influenza-like illness. Whereas for COVID, it could easily be 30 to 50 percent <coughs> or perhaps even higher. We will find out as we go. But this means even if your IFR is comparable, you probably have three times as many deaths, ICU and hospital admissions, just because us not having enough immunity, we still are weaving our carpet of immunity over time that we would make it into something which is comparable with influenza. And that's really important to realize. So we're still a moment uh, away from endemicity. But the good news is if we now are not disruptive in the next few months, probably the next wave that we will be seeing is in late autumn. And if this is really just a subvariant of Omicron, vaccination and perhaps a little bit of masking might be all that is needed in, a, in addition, of course, to really continued recovery efforts for our healthcare system. <coughs> so when you look at what happened, you know, we broke this Omicron wave here and then we made it not to something like here, it was then more like this here, this would have been the natural wave originally. So we made it to something like this and then into a next um, BA2 wave that you see here. The reason that you find such a low number of infections here is this is overshooting um, infections and therefore overshooting short-term immunity. Everybody gets immune at the same time. There aren't many people left, you know, since you need such a long time to make it down from this from, from this mountain here of infections. There aren't many people left who are susceptible. Then you have a honeymoon and everybody loses immunity at the same time, infection-induced immunity, and then you have the next wave, no? We didn't do that. Our population in Ontario broke the wave marvelously. We made it down and we made it to this. That actually looks really uh, 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 roughly the, 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 the way one would expect this right now. And now we're basically on this downward slope here. And if we're a bit lucky, we will of course see waning immunity, waning from uh, the infection induced immunity, waning of 
vaccine-induced immunity. And if you're a bit lucky, we will just spend a wonderful summer and uh, have a good mass vaccination rollout just here and then move into something which already looks much less tremendous than what we've seen before. And if we have a few of, you know, seasons like that after a few years, we will make it into endemicity. So what are the conclusions? I think we did a tremendously good job. Many of us being out there and really speaking up where this is going. It's important to really only talk about what you actually know and uh, not, nothing else. We had, unfortunately, quite a few clinicians out there who may be good clinicians, but they don't have a clue about mathematical models, neither about EPI nor about research methods. And they continue to say, oh, it's all not a problem. We had a few of those, but the majority was with us. And that's important. And, you know, I really, during this, I wasn't, a uh, and I'm still not a mathematical modeler, but I started to build quite a lot of models. I have a background in Bayesian stats, a lot of methods, etc. you know, that I've been around for, uh, uh, after graduation for 26 years. So for me, it, well, it, it was easy to uh, just, you know, get immersed into that. And while I wasn't an infectious disease epidemiologist before or an infectious disease mathematical modeler, I'm probably pretty okay, meanwhile, with my knowledge and with my understanding there. And a lot of clinicians out there just uh, committed epistemic uh, trespassing, unfortunately, which is not good. Clear, consistent, and fully transparent communication is really important, and this needs to be independent from elected decision makers. If the public has the impression that you give them selected messages, it doesn't work. You just need to be honest all the time and you need to use the pincer principle if you want to move something. Uh, what happens, whether we have seasonal waves or such as or summer waves again, would um, just depend on whether we have just something that looks relatively trivial as BA4 or BA5. I hope I'm right. I hope they continue to be relatively trivial. Then expect a seasonal wave in autumn or uh, something new, entirely new. Remember, uh, evolution still has a lot of opportunities. Then it could get disruptive and we could see a summer wave. And based on everything we know, we need to continue to weave our carpet of immunity through several seasons. So if you're a bit lucky, perhaps we need another two autumns and winters where it needs, it's a bit harsher. Um, and we, we make it then into endemicity, but it most likely won't happen already in 2022. And I think that's the last slide which uh, struck me. This was uh, Marie Agnes Strack Zimmermann, um, and a German politician, not talking about COVID, but to talking about the, uh, the German uh, chancellor, 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 I don't know how to call it. Um, but I think it holds, if you don't do the storytelling yourself, and this also and especially holds for the public, others will. So I think it was of tremendous importance that we all were speaking up during the last two years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That was a, an amazing overview over um, about the past two years and, uh, and the leadership the scientific table took with it. Um, I will open the floor to the questions. Michael. I have, I have a question. Uh, Peter, thanks for that. That was a terrific uh, uh, overview of a huge amount of work. Um, and uh, I'll like just echo Natalie's, echo Natalie's thanks to you personally for all of the work that you did uh, over these past, uh, how many years is it now? Two years, three years, I've lost track. Uh, and you will be missed, but uh, we know where to find you. So uh, that's that's good to know. Um, maybe if you were to reflect and, and maybe rather than looking back, but look forward. Um, so, you know, you talked a little bit about what we can expect from, from COVID, but just generally speaking, um, what do you think that Ontario as a whole has learned about management of health crises like the pandemic and future pandemics? Do you, do you feel somehow optimistic about how we might better handle a future similar challenge? Do you feel we're gonna forget everything and go back to uh, status quo and have to learn all over again? Um, or is it maybe just too early to tell? I'm just curious about, you know, as you're on the boat on the way, uh, uh, <laughs> leaving offshore, what are your reflections looking back at us that 
diminishing in your rear view mirror? I think that is people in general won't forget that easily, no? That, that uh, this was such a, a crazy journey that we all went together. People have internalized some of that. That's probably, that's the good news here. The, uh, the bad news is we're all humans and therefore, you know, okay, you know, we forget and we take it easy again, etc. And we will certainly make mistakes again. But I think this was, this will change the way we're approaching things. And we, we are in a much, much different shape than we are, than we uh, used to be uh, two years ago. We know now pandemics happen, you know, globally. We have a tremendously successful vaccine technology out there that helps. And um, we, uh, we started to do trials differently. I think we would know during the last, uh, during the next 20 years or so again, how to pull this off relatively swiftly if it gets worse. You know, the next virus could be much worse. Remember once more, the original wild type virus is like my, well, she's dead, my lame grandmother. You know, it was so like so lame, basically, so nothing, and we now are able to deal with much uh, worse challenges already. I really hope that, especially scientifically and technologically, we made some 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 progress, and that we could revert back to uh, doing what what is needed if uh, a new pandemic hits. So I'll, uh, I'll take executive privilege and just extend everything to about 105 since we got a little bit of a late start. So we'll just keep, if that's okay with you, Dr. Juni, do you have a few minutes for of us? Of course, yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Please don't call me Dr. Juni, please, Peter. <laughs> Peter, okay, Martin Yaffe has a question. We can't hear you, Martin. You may not. You might need to type it. Uh, you may not be connected uh, with the microphone. I'm gonna type the mic. Sorry, now can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah sorry about that. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation and for your wonderful work. Um, I was very impressed uh, with the data that we've seen coming from wastewater uh, measurements. And I was wondering if you see opportunities for further exploitation for those kind of signals and incorporating it kind of as a standard way of monitoring what's going on with respect to infectious diseases. Yeah, so we, we basically developed that on the fly when Omicron hit. We knew, okay, uh, the, the, you know, uh, the testing system was overwhelmed at that time, and we had uh, initiated the, uh, the, the wastewater surveillance program thanks to you know, colleagues from, from, uh, from Ottawa and, uh, and uh, Waterloo. And, uh, and other places spearheading it. We then worked on really expanding that and the system has had been ready for quite some time, but there was no consistent way of analyzing it. And uh, my colleague, Bruno da Costa, who is now the, the uh, acting director of the Applied Health Research Center and I, we just tried to pull that off within days, basically, to uh, really account for the data structure, et cetera, and come up with something that is representative for the province. And it actually worked tremendously well. And uh, we now got the grants to develop and validate, uh, to further develop and validate the methods. And we most certainly will continue to work on that. And it should, from my perspective, but obviously I'm biased, um, since it's a, it's a bit my baby, um, it should be one of the major cornerstones of surveillance. It cannot be the only one because we also would need a random sample of people and probably, you know, um, surveillance at hospital admission to understand also what happens on an individual level. For instance, um, immunization could not be determined based on wastewater. For that, you also need to have some random sample of people being surveyed properly just, uh, just uh, on an individual level. But uh, at the fraction of the cost, uh, you know, on our typically our testing would cost 2.4 million per day at a fraction of per day, the regular testing at a fraction of the cost per, for perhaps 10, 12 million per year. Uh, you are able to do your job properly if you combine it with an elegant small surveillance system. Um, Candace McNaughton had a question in the chat. Um, first, thanking you for your leadership. And then second, um, what are the, your thoughts on therapeutics going forward, like uh, Paxlovid, and what role maybe minor is that going to have on ongoing waves? 
Yeah, that's a really great question. And uh, I actually forgot to include a slide on that. Sorry for that. You're completely right. If we pull off the distribution, meaning we don't make Paxlovid prescriptions, just the tokenism and say, we've distributed so and so many pa uh, Paxlovid doses and it's all honky-dory, but we really do our job and bring it to those people who need it most meaning could be fully vaccinated people with two or three or even four doses who are highly vulnerable for various reasons, including uh, immunocompromise, being immunocompromised, meaning it's those people who are not vaccinated yet, meaning it's people, you know, in socioeconomic uh, uh, difficult circumstances, all of that matters. And it's a hell of a job to actually achieve equity in distribution of testing and Paxlovid prescription for those who need it most. So we have a lot to do. If this works, it would be helpful. If, it, if it's more a bit of a tokenism, then perhaps not so much. And um, Paxlovid will be interesting to see how it goes. I start to believe that probably five days for uh, some people or for many people might not be enough. And I start to fear a bit that uh, with five days of Paxlovid, we might end up in a resistance problem relatively soon. So, you know, there needs to be consistent development for sure. Interesting. Um, Robin Alter has her hand up. Yes, um, you know, I realize you couldn't include everything in your talk, although you included a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm interested in uh, if you can make some comments about the differences in ages, especially with children and um, especially the group under six, which is not vaccinated. What do we know about uh, those those groups in terms of infections, hospitalizations and deaths? Yes. So uh, again, remember, I'm a garden variety general internist and not a pediatrician, and I haven't seen children with uh, COVID on the wards as uh, others on this call might have. But what my colleagues tell me is that, uh, you, of course, you have a high force of infection, but that what we're seeing as behavior of uh, Omicron now is probably a bit more RSV-like, you know, and that the uh, hospital admissions that we're seeing would be like my... Uh, eight-year-old who when he was uh, three, four, and five uh, for with every single cold or nearly with every cold, we were at the edge of being hospitalized because of his, uh, of his uh, 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 you know, airway system basically just uh, obstructing uh, and therefore we needed to go to the hospital and we then started to, you know, deal with it from home. And if he would have ended up with COVID, he would have been one of the candidates and uh, fortunately outgrew it and his, uh, his airways are big enough now. So I would believe still that most of what we see with Omicron now in this age group is actually RSV-like, but we of course may uh, see a bit more because the force of infection was so high. Wastewater allowed us, we do that really based on um, daily growth from wastewater and then we just uh, continue you now on a daily update, uh, we, 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 we look into case counts. At the, at the peak of the current wave, we probably had around 100,000 infections per day. And of course, there's a, that's a lot of uh, force of infection also for kids. Uh, so I believe it's, it's reason for optimism. This, this, it won't be such a big challenge. There's also some other reason for optimism, which is ONS data that just came out indicating that the, um, as expected or as hoped, not expected, but as hoped, because of tissue tropism of uh, Omicron being different than previous variants, the risk of long COVID, and this probably also holds for children, there's no data yet, but I extrapolate there, is lower with Omicron than with previous variants. And again, that's great news, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I, it's 108, so we'll let you go so you can get back to your other jobs. Um, thank you so much. And um, thank you for everyone who joined us today. Thanks for having me. All right, Karen, I, I have thank to you. go. Um, yeah. I have to go take care of some stuff in the merge now, so. Okay, uh, take care. On. Thank you, thanks. All right. Thanks bye a lot, bye. Peter. Best wishes in Oxford. Bye, bye-bye. Okay, take care.